All the action from preseason on Monday night. Zach Eady has another monster game for the Grizzlies. Can he win rookie of the year? Ben Simmons is back? Question mark. The Bucks look a little bit bigger. Plus, we're going to talk about who are going to be the best defenses in the NBA this season. We'll give you our predictions and we'll preview the Northwest Division as well. All that and more on Locked On NBA. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On NBA, your daily source for all things NBA from the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for joining us and making us part of your day. Appreciate you guys being with us here on a Tuesday. My name is Matt Moore. I'm the senior NBA writer for the Action Network, co-host of Locked On Nuggets and this fine program alongside David Ramil. He's co-host of Locked On Heat. We're going to get into all of the preseason takes from Monday night in the association. Lots of big games going on around preseason as much as there can be. Uh, Trey Young was in action. He had a big game from Zach Eady. Paul George got banged up. We'll talk about that. Plus, we're going to give you our predictions on the top five defenses this season. We'll talk about that. And we'll we will finish up. We've been doing this on our version of the program here on Locked on NBA. Previewing every division, we'll give you our predictions for the Northwest division but david let's start here with the association what was the biggest thing that you noticed from perusing preseason basketball on a monday well it was a big game from zach Eady, who finished with 23 points off the bench for the memphis grizzlies i think that's got everybody a buzz about his potential uh, you mentioned the potential rookie of the year candidacy i think it was the big game uh it's either that or the paul george injury which i think has finally calmed down a little bit. Like when we first saw the video and it was not a good looking, it was not It was not a pretty sight to see his left knee buckle the way it did uh, in a game versus the Atlanta Hawks. They just, again, Paul George, given his injury history, given his age and the concerns about the 76ers, fresh off the heels of a quote from Joel Embiid that he doesn't anticipate playing back-to-back -back games for the duration of his career, it kind of sank Sixers' hopes uh, very deeply uh, but following the game it seemed like he was walking around and he was much more comfortable and he didn't anticipate any problems so I'm sure there'll be a full diagnosis hopefully there won't be anything wrong with George so it's one of those things one is a positive one not so much although again there is some light at the end of that tunnel regarding George's injury yeah today's show I want to let you know is brought to you by FanDuel you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel place your first five dollar bet and you'll get started with two hundred dollars in bonus bets guaranteed visit FanDuel.com to get started yeah on PG I think if it, you know Gina Mizell of the uh Inquirer was talking to him and it just sounded like he was not all that concerned about it now yeah. if they find something that's obviously the, the worry right but in general, I think that there's not like a lot to be concerned about there. Um, preseason, otherwise, like, you know, these are times to kind of get excited about rookies. Like, hey, he looks pretty good. Or, hey, this guy looks bigger. Um, I'll actually start here. We'll get to Edie in a second. But I do want to start with this. Uh, the Bucks tonight without Chris Middleton, who's um, taking it very, very, very easy in preseason. Um, their starters tonight were Dame, Giannis, Brooke Lopez. So that trio, that, that consistent part of the core. Gary Trent Jr. started at the two. I think there's a lot of expectation he will start at the two guard. And then Torian Prince. I really liked the way that that lineup looked. Um, they just looked bigger. They looked uh, like they actually had length. Now, I, I worry a little bit. Gary Trent Jr., I think, is he's not the weak point on that defense because it's obviously Dame. But you can cover a little bit more for Dame just from the perspective of because he's such a target, you know how to kind of prepare for it versus that secondary guy sometimes has – some issues uh, very first play of the game now offensively was a dribble handoff between Giannis and Dame and Dame hit a long pull up too. that could have been a three very clean looking Giannis was very aggressive in this game um, yeah. I, I will say that I came away a Bulls team resting most of their key guys I did come away a little bit like huh okay like Bucks look a little bit more physical Bucks look a little bit more tough the Bucks look a little bit more dialed in I'm a little bit more confident in the Bucks after watching their preseason through these first couple of games than maybe I was coming into preseason. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. I, I think 
you know, I had concerns about Chris Middleton, and obviously those are still there because we haven't seen him throughout the preseason, and he's slowly being worked in there. But I, I do like the connection and the connectivity between Dame and Giannis. It seems like it's taken a whole other level in this preseason, given their offseason and the fact that they didn't work out together, and that was much ballyhooed. We talked about it on this show. There were concerns going into the season whether or not they'd be able to continue to grow off of last season, which did look clunky at times, and I think both players would admit that, but they did look much smoother in tonight's uh, game, and uh, I think that's certainly a strength moving forward. Um, I will say, though, you know, you pointed out the defensive concerns in that backcourt. You know, they gave up 29 threes in the first half to the Chicago Bulls. Hmm. That's less than ideal. And, I mean, you, you, it's not that long ago that this was a team that was number one in three-point defense allowed. And, and I, I mean, obviously, they allow a lot of threes by design. At least that was a, a, the case during uh, when, when uh, Budenholzer was their coach. But to give up that many threes kind of feels like, well, you're taxing Brooke Lopez a lot as he's in drop coverage. And then, of course, with Lillard and Trent, neither of them known as great defenders. That's going to allow for a lot of open looks from, from opponents. So I wonder if that's a concern moving forward. As much as you might be encouraged by some of the good things you saw out of Milwaukee, I think there are also some legitimate concerns until Middleton comes back, too. Uh how about Maz Bazelis getting them nine three pointers? I was kind of amused by that. Um, yeah, I will say this though. You know, it's pre. You know how you know it's preseason. A Billy Donovan team is actually shooting threes. That's how you know it's preseason. Um, yeah, we'll never I'll pace for sixty at one point. So, I mean, I, well, you know, I'll say this: like every team, it seems like is every team's coach talks about we want to shoot more threes this season. Mm-hmm. Everybody talks Indiana. about even the Celtics in Indiana. Even those two are like, no, no, no we can shoot more. <laughs> Um, but I think it's hard to carry that over in a regular season. That's one of the reasons why, you know, taking the regular season results, I think, or the preseason results is always, you never want to take it too seriously. You have to get like very granular with the analysis. Um, but that's like another layer of it where it's like, okay, yeah, your defense looked bad, but also they shot a ton more threes than they're probably going to in the regular season. Your scouting report will probably look, you will actually, first you'll actually read a scouting report um before the game and then two it probably will look a little bit different when you get there uh zach Eady was a big name in the association tonight again uh great performance for him from the memphis grizzlies as ed comes off the bench in this one and he goes for 23 points on 10 to 15 shooting nine boards and he, you know he he came in versus isaiah jackson and he just like he did the spin move drop step yeah. dunk, which you never see in the league anymore. Like nobody yeah. pulls that off anymore. And then um, I think, you know, the guy into Turner's minutes and Turner on the first possession, like beast him, like really fought him for like denied him the ball twice and then ripped the ball away from him. And I was like, Oh, okay. So like now he'll see what it's like facing a real big and to Edie's credit. He came right back at Turner and he hit a hook shot and then a follow through am one and then got another one to go off balance. So like, that's the thing with Edie is his touch is really impressive. There's all these kind of questions about the fit. And I think it's fair to ask those questions with how fast Memphis is. They have all these athletes and then there's Zach Edie. But I will say this, that one of the things that'll be very helpful is if none of the other actions, like the, if the other team jams an action, like you're running a pin down and up, oh, nope, they covered it. Oh, they switched it. And you're getting late in the clock. It's really nice to be able to be like, hey, I'm going to give it to the seven foot guy and he can shoot a hook shot close to the rim and there's a pretty good chance that he'll make it. I'm not saying Edie's going to be the bailout option a lot, but I do think that Edie's going to be able to have basically found offense quite a bit this season. I think it gives him a good chance at rookie of the year. That's a, you know, we were debating whether or not he would even start. And your thought is that he is going to continue to start, obviously, as Jaron Jackson Jr. works his way back from injury and he's going to get more opportunities there. But I, I do agree there that it, you can't deny this amount of space he takes up and the ease with which he can score. Like, you know, he's going to have his growing pains, obviously. But I think at this point in time, looking at other centers around the league, like I, there aren't many who are going to be able to match up and contest and challenge him given his size, given that touch that you mentioned, his facility being able to score around the basket. He just he looks like a, a pretty solid NBA player. So he's got the skills. He's got the size, certainly. It makes it an easy target. And you're right. I mean, there are a number of possessions there where you can just kind of feed him in the low post and watch him go to work and be like, yep, he's going to be able to get a bucket over pretty much anybody. And if there's a mismatch, that's too easy for him. That is going to be very available for him. So 
I could see him being kind of that bailout, uh, you know, if a shot clock is winding down, et cetera. So it, it could lead to scoring in bunches. I don't know what that winds up looking like. I don't know how the rest of this rookie class that, you know, obviously wasn't uh, well, <laughs> predicted to be very favorable. Obviously, there wasn't a star at the top of the uh, of the draft or anything like that the way there was last year with Victor Wembanyama. It's not going to get the same hype, but there are a number of really good, solid players so far from what we've seen of this rookie class. And I think Edie's going to be one of them. And I think he's got a pretty as good a chance as anybody of rookie of the year. All right, up next, we're going to talk about defense. And we're going to give you our predictions for who are going to be the top five defenses by the end of the season. We'll talk about that up next here on Locked On NBA. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time, best way for you to get tickets to any sort of deal. They've got all sorts of awesome things. They've got the super deal. They You're going to get to see your seats before you buy them. Uh, they've got lowest price guarantee. They've got that cancellation protection. They've got so much good stuff. All of their things are built to make it easier for you to buy tickets for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. You can get all in pricing. You toggle that on and you're not going to get caught with any surprise fees or anything else. You're knowing what you're paying for up front. Your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase, and take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N N B A for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? It's Game Time. We'll be right back on Locked On NBA. Back here on Locked on NBA, thanks for joining us here on a Tuesday. Matt Moore alongside David Ramil. Hope your week is going great. You can catch all of our great shows here on Locked on NBA throughout the week with all of our great hosts. All right, David, so I want to talk about this because I think it's an interesting question of predicting the top five defenses, and in part because I've done some research on this, and I was talking to you before the show, the defense isn't as sticky as we think it might be. And you were like, what does that mean? And I said, there's kind of an idea, and this is pretty normal, that Whatever happened, we saw before is what will happen again, right? So right. they were great on defense last year. So they're going to be good. Then they have all the same players. So they're going to be good on defense this year. The results of that are actually a little bit more mixed. Now, I only have data on this going back to about 2011. So it's about 13 seasons, not including 2020 because everything got messed up with COVID. But when we kind of look back, the average defensive rank for a top five defensive team is 11 the following season and the top uh the rank for a top 10 defense in a given season is 12 the following season so we kind of see that a lot of teams tend to fall out they don't tend to just slot back in that's not to say that a lot of teams aren't top five both seat both years because it does happen quite a bit especially with you know when you've got roster continuity but i think kind of looking at the season and especially i'm very curious how one of the things i do not have an answer for is how are the games going to be officiated because yeah. how they were officiated at the end of the year was not how they were officiated at the beginning of the year. And we saw some wild swings in defensive numbers, including a team that made the finals in the Mavericks by the season's end. Um, but I'm, so I'm curious, let's go back and forth on this. Who do you think is going to be, give me one of the teams that you think will be a top five defense next season. I think it's a no brainer. I'm going with the Minnesota Timberwolves. They were a great defense last year. I think any team with Rudy Gobert is pretty much slated to be a top five defense. And I think that's going to continue to be the case this year as well. So I think like uh, the challenge, the only challenge I think there is if the continuity changes, adding Randall for cat, because cat really did have a high level of give a flip last year. He tried really hard on defense. And if I'm very curious about this Dante DiVincenzo stuff, because I kind of wonder if he winds up starting and taking Mike Conley's starting spot. And Conley mm -hmm. shifts to a backup guard. Not that Conley can't play starter, but just right. that like, hey, Dante's really good. And like Mike's 37. It's probably okay for him to take some you know, nights off and have a lesser role this season. So I'm just kind of curious about that. And if that happens, what does that do to the defense? Because Mike's still a very sound defender. But overall, the answer is like, yes. If you give Rudy Gobert, this is why the end of the Utah run was so disappointing he they weren't a top 10 defense if you have rudy gobert it is so easy to build a top five defense like you just have to have guys who are decent at point of attack and ants is good 
and Jalen McDaniels, Jaden McDaniels is great. Um, so those two guys, I think, along you with like the- Randall's yeah. fit there too. I mean, obviously the continuity is an issue, but I mean, given that he, if he's healthy and when he returns, he can play defense, especially as he's you know looking for a contract, etc. I, I think those are motivating factors. You like the fit alongside Gobert offensively, but defensively, do you think it's a good concern? I do have some concern about it because I think in part cat's a better weak side rim protector than Randall is in part, just because Randall has a very, like they'll, the biggest knock on Randall since he was a prospect is his wingspan. Um, right. I used to call him T-Rex because he's this big monster with little tiny arms. And that's like, that's who he is. And so the uh, potential for him to kind of clean up the weak side, not that cats like a uh, jump out the gym, Jaron Jackson type defender, but just like cats, a big dude. And he's got a good wingspan and Randall's have built a little bit differently. So I do have some concerns about that. Um, I'll give you one of the teams that I think will be top five. And uh, that is going to be once again, the Boston Celtics. Um, look, mm-hmm. it, you, you play, if you can switch as cleanly as they can with their personnel, you're going to have a really good defense. Um, teams are better at switching than they ever have been, which is actually one of the funny things is they added Porzingis. And I think one of the ideas was, oh, he can switch too. And they actually play a ton of drop when KP plays. And Tillman, who's going to play a lot this season because Al Horford is a million years old, Tillman's more of a drop big too. Like X can definitely switch on the perimeter, but he is much more of a drop big. Their thing is that they can play any sort of combination of defense that they need to. And they have so much continuity and chemistry. All of those switches are clean. They never miss. They never screw up those communications. They're never off target. And with Derek White and Drew Holiday, they're still going to be really good. Porzingis should be back by like November, December. And there's another rim protector. Uh, Tatum is, that's probably the most underrated thing about Jason Tatum is how much of an elite wing defender he is. He is a problem to deal with. And so, yeah, I will go with the Boston Celtics and the team that I think is in the top five. So we got Wolves and Celtics coming back from last season give me another one that you think will be there maybe i'm overstating it but the addition of alex caruso i think is going to make the oklahoma city thunder a nice defensive team i don't i don't know but i mean another year they're going to continue growing they're getting better i still like the i I like their ability to be able to defend multiple positions so i i think thunder could be a top five defense I mean, they should be right. Like the problem with the thunder is just trying not to parrot everybody else. Who's like, they're so awesome. Like it's very hard to build the contrarian position is the thunder won't be that good. And every time that you go through like any sort of basketball analysis, you're just like, yeah, why, ah, why wouldn't they be, <laughs> why wouldn't they be awesome? Um, I think defensively they've got great redundancy and flexibility. Like I've thought a lot about this, like, Oh, Shay's out. Well, I guess we're going to have to win with defense. Good thing we can throw out Kaysen Wallace, Alex Caruso, Lou Dort, Jalen Williams, and Chet Holmgren alongside Isaiah Hartenstein if need be. Like they just have an endless kind of just flow of defenders. I was talking to, to somebody this week who knows OKC really well, and they were like, Don't sleep on Aaron Wiggins either. He's a really underrated defender. They just have like guys pouring out of Sam Presti's ears that can defend. So yeah, I understand why you would say that. Um, I will go with your team. Uh, the Miami Heat. So uh, it, I just, for me, they kind of, it took them a while and they kind of snuck into top five by the end of the season. That was, it was like, yeah. you know, they're not great. Oh, hey, like they're a top five defense. Much like Gobert, if you got Bam out of bio, I think you should be a top five defense. They're just extremely elite. Um, they have a high level of effort and care and attention to detail because of suppose coaching, they're physical. Yeah. Um, I think like even guys that aren't physical are physical. Like Duncan Robinson is physical despite being Duncan Robinson. Kevin Love is physical despite being Kevin Love to the degree that he can be. Um, so I, you know, I don't know what that offense is going to look like. I don't know what this team's going to look like, but I do think that they're going to be another top five defense. And so uh, I will put the Miami Heat here. I have them on my list as well, and I have a question mark next to them because I think there's a big concern about the backcourt in particular. Where you're looking at Terry Rozier and Tyler Hero, but given, again, a preseason game, their first action together, the first time we've seen what is the projected starting lineup ever, and they look pretty good. Like Their attention to defense was fantastic. They gave a lot of effort. There was some physicality there from Hero, something we have not seen from him in the past. And Rozier, you know, he's been known to be a good defender in the past. I don't think he had the, uh, as you put it, the same give a flip attitude in Charlotte. Because why would you? It was the Charlotte Hornets. They weren't doing anything. But now that he's in Miami and the expectation is there and he's healthy, 
I think we'll see a return there. And, and you know what? You pointed it out as far as the officiating is concerned. If there's a team that might benefit and be physical and not get those calls against them, it's probably Miami. And that being the case, they'll probably wind up being a top five defense. So I like the pick. Uh, I've also got the Orlando Magic. Another team from Florida as a top five defense. Obviously, they were pretty damn good last year. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be now with the addition of KCP. I think they're going to continue to play defense at a high level. Obviously, Jalen Suggs is probably one of the most underrated defenders in the league. They obviously, had a breakout last year. I think he's going to continue to be better. I just like the magic defensively. Offensively, who knows what's going to happen, but defensively, they're going to be a pretty good team. Uh, I don't have the magic here. I Ooh. probably should. Uh, but I couldn't make room for them because I think both the, the Cavaliers and the Grizzlies are going to be top five defenses. Okay. And um, Cavs have been really consistent there. Kenny Atkinson, maybe that changes, but I do think it's yep. uh, kind of an interesting one. And then Grizzlies, like, just look. I mean, Jaron's going to be back. They've got dogs at every position. Like, they're going to be good. They're, they're going to be good. So, um, tough, a lot of tough defenses next season in a league where defense is hard to come by. So, there's a look at what we think about the top five defenses next season. On the other side, we're going to wrap it up. We've finally gotten to the end of our parade of divisions. We're going to do the Northwest Division. We'll give you a, a look at who's going to win it, who's not going to win it, and who might be a little bit sneaky in that division. Up next here on Locked On NBA. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. When you get the hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Lots of great NBA bets at FanDuel as well. You can bet on win totals. You can bet on, obviously, title futures. You can get in on divisions. You can get in on all sorts of awards. Great stuff in there. Jalen Williams uh, from the Thunder to win most improved player. Very popular pick. Getting a lot of steam right now. You can check that out at FanDuel. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. We'll be right back on Locked On NBA. Back here, final segment with David Ramil. You can catch him over at Locked On Heat. I'm Matt Moore. You can catch me at Locked On Nuggets. All right, David, we've reached the end of the road. Final division for us. We've gone through all these divisions uh, starting way back when you know we could barely even see the season. Now it's a, a week away as we sit here with a, a week to go. Um, so let's start here right at the top. This Northwest division has three serious title contenders. The yeah. 2023 NBA champion Denver Nuggets the 2024 Western Conference 1C, the Oklahoma City Thunder, and the Western Conference finalist, Minnesota Timberwolves. Who do you think is going to win the Northwest Division? We've talked about it before. You, you've made your concerns about the Nuggets, and you know them very well. And you've also talked about the Wolves and the possibility of there being some issues there in continuity and the new additions to the team, etc., I'm going with the Thunder. I think it's an easy pick, and I know maybe it sounds like a lot of other picks that have been made there, but given what they added to this roster, that they still have an MVP-type player in, in, in uh, Shea Gilgis-Alexander, that they continue to grow, develop these young players, that team just looks so impressive, and I think they're just going to be a fantastic group. They're going to be – I mean, I, I think they're going to be the number one seed pretty clearly in the Western Conference, and I think they're going to win the division pretty clearly as well. The only reason that I'm like, I've, it's just pure contrarianism where I'm like, we're all so sure OKC is going to be awesome and yeah. elite. And I mentioned this and I'm just like, yeah, but it never goes that way. Like sports are unpredictable. Right. Right. But I don't know. We'll see. Didn't we um, do this about Boston last year though? Like didn't everybody say, oh, Boston's going to be really good. And well, guess what? They turned out to be pretty really good. good. Yeah. yeah. Um, although I think everyone had faith in them in the regular season. Um, it was the, but the, the counter was like, well, we think they'll be great in the regular season, but somebody will get them in the playoffs. And then everyone's yeah. pets heads fell off in the playoffs. Um, the only, the only team I've really thought about here, I, it's not Denver. It's the wolves. Um, yeah. this Dante DiVincenzo thing has me like really pretty excited. They're so, huh. they're so on board with him. Like he was the guy I think that they really wanted in that trade. And like, they really think that he can unlock stuff. And if you look at that offense and you're just like, Hey, what if we add an elite shooter to Anthony Edwards, Jaden McDaniels and Rudy Gobert? Like that sounds like a really good idea. Um, the Julius Randall part actually kind of complicates this. I keep wondering if we're, they're going to move him again. We'll see kind of what, how this shakes out that he still hasn't played in preseason. Um, 
I'm just really curious to see how this is all going to kind of go. But the Wolves, I think, are very – like, I have the Wolves rated very highly and I've upgraded them from the preseason because of all this. Like, I just think that they could be really good again. But the problem is that they are they don't have as much depth as OKC does. Gobert's 32, Conley's 37. And that those two is like, all right, their margin for error isn't as wide as OKC's, where – if you told me Shea misses a month, I'm still going to be like, yeah, the Thunder are okay. Like, they have so much shooting and so much defense and so many playmakers and so many good guys. Like, they're still going to find a way to win games. They won't beat the elites, but they'll still be really good. Um, they can miss Chet Holmgren, and they're fine because of Hartenstein. They can miss Jalen Williams, and they're fine because of their wings. They're just they've – got, they've got redundancy and matchability. They can cater to any matchup. Basketball wise, I, don't, I can't get around it. Yeah, I'm with you. The Oklahoma City Thunder are going to win the division uh, and probably the one seed. All right. So if they're going to win the division, who's going to finish last? And this one's uh, a little interesting, I think. Is it? I guess, I guess I'm leaning Blazers as the likeliest choice, but I guess the Jazz could give them a run for their money. I, I, I don't know. I, when you're looking at this Blazers roster, you already hear about Shaden Sharp and his injury. Um, DeAndre Eaton's supposed to have this monster bounce back here, but we've been hearing this for a number of seasons now. Uh, I, I just don't have any faith that Chauncey Billups is going to be able to get this group to kind of seem like a competent basketball team anytime soon. And, and that being the case, I think they'll probably lose. The division, I, I just, I, I can see the Jazz. I mean, their roster doesn't impress anyone, and I think that's by design also, but I think they're just going to be out coached. They're going to be better. They're going to be coached better than the Blazers will. And that being the case, I give them a slight edge, uh, not by much, maybe a game or two, but that's all it'll take. And so I've got the Blazers last. Utah will, you know, be not a very good team, but they'll they'll win just enough to not lose the division outright. So I was prepared to say Blazers. They seem, you know, the, every indication is they're ready to go all in for Cooper Flag for that chase, right? Especially with Scoot Henderson looking abysmal in preseason. Uh -huh. Like, it's getting getting concerning. Um, The issue is, like, you know, my wife and I were talking about, like, you know, me going to a game uh, to see Utah. And I was like, well, I got to go. It's Utah. And she's like, who's on that team? And I was like, well, Lori, Lori Bargain. He's really good. She's like, okay, who else? And I was like. You know, Colin Sexton was sneaky good last year. He was really good. She's like, okay, who else? And I was like, Jordan Jordan Clarkson's like a former six man of the year, and he might might be on that team by the end of it. Who else? I'm like John Collins, who I used to think was good in Atlanta. She's like, who else? And I was like, I'm running out of guys. Keyshawn George, that's a that's a name. Not to, yeah, 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 he's yeah. And it just it gets it gets bad real quick with this jazz roster. So like I think there's a chance. Um I think one of the interesting questions is going to be exactly how committed Portland is to it because Portland does have like, okay, they have Deandre Ayton. They have Denny Avdia, who's actually a really good player. Um, hmm. Anthony Simons, you and I have the same kind of opinion about he's of that mold of players that you and I are kind of like, uh, huh. Um, mm -hmm. but he'll get numbers, right? Shaden Sharp shows a little bit of potential. I like do Reef a lot. That's like a name that nobody's going to really care about, but I like him as a player. Um, the question for me is going to be, do they sell because they, they need to get a guy. If Scoot's not the guy, they have to go get a guy. It's not Anthony Simons. Anthony Simons is not the guy. So if they're going to get the guy in a draft where you got Flag and Ace Bailey um, and all these other draft picks, which are supposed to be very highly regarded, this is supposed to be a deep draft in terms of who you could get, like top four picks, any one of those guys could be a franchise guy. How much do they go for it? And I'm assuming they'll go for it enough. So I will say Blazers – but I do think it could get kind of dicey if Portland get if Portland has one of those weird um, Novembers where it's like the the Blazers are eight and seven and we're like what's what's happening? Um, how quickly will they kind of turn the corner? Is the question? Utah Utah has the home court advantage too. Like it's so hard to win in Utah, just you know, especially when you're traveling to Denver. And then Utah, you've got the altitude advantage there. Like I think that's problematic even for a team that's not particularly good or deep or anything like that or talented at this point. But yeah, I, I don't know. Give them a slight edge anyway. So we'll see how it plays out. But which leads us to which team is the pluckiest? And tell me why it shouldn't be the Denver Nuggets. We already talked about the top two teams in the, in the division. We talked about the two worst teams in the division. It's got to be the Nuggets, right? But can you consider them plucky given the fact that they have the best player on the planet and that they've won a championship just two seasons ago? 
Yeah, the the nobody believes in us chip on their shoulder, right? Like Jamal Murray looks bad in in preseason, already got knee issues. Are they going to pay Aaron Gordon? Tension mm. between the front office and the coaching staff. Um their their youth is nobody's good in the in, on the bench unit, all of these types of things. They're definitely I think that candidate um I guess it has to be them. I would actually say that there's nobody who's who's plucky. Plucky. Yeah, because like if you're if you're going up against the Nuggets, you're still like, oh, God, I got to deal with Joker like, (laughs) you know, all night long. And if you're going against the Wolves, you're like, well, this is going to be a pain all night long dealing with their defense. Um, And OKC is really good. And, you know, so I can't see Utah. uh, Now, Will Hardy's a really good coach. I think we think. So maybe, but. Um, it's just hard to kind of find it in this division. I don't think that there's any surprises because this one has, like we, I said at the top, this is three serious title contenders. Um, I didn't want to ask you that though. Do you still, cons- so there's been this debate, like are, are the Nuggets still contenders? And I've been very confused by it. Cause I'm like, guys, they still have Jokic and Murray and Gordon yeah. and MPJ and like all the, so like you're with me that like, they're still very much in contender tier. Yeah, very much so. Uh, I mean, you, you know about the the vibes of the team better than anybody. And, and you know, you talk about these these conflicts there. That just seems like a team that has used all these kinds of perceived chips more effectively than any other group over the last few seasons. And maybe it's just the nature of having a guy who controls the tempo and the, the flow of a game better than anybody else on the planet. But they kind of seem to also use these kinds of slights and motivations very effectively. What are the chances that they can kind of bottle up all this tension and all this crap that's kind of circling this team and say, you know what, we're just going to kind of fall ass backwards into another 55 win season. Pretty high. Um, Their model is kind of like the Spurs and the Spurs did that a couple of times when everyone was like, the Spurs aren't going to do anything. Like, yeah, they're good. We respect them, but like, they're not going to do anything. And then it's like the Spurs are in the finals again. Like they just, you know, so that's kind of the the idea. I think Um, on the other hand, I will just tell you, I, the vibes are not immaculate. That's what I will say about being close. I don't think that they expect them to be, or they're not, and they're not trying them to be. They're just like, okay, we'll deal with the regular season again. We'll make another run in the spring. Um, this is work for them. It's no longer kind of the joy. They're they're doing the work now. Uh, all right, that's going to do it for Locked On NBA. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate you guys being with us. Next week we'll be well. We'll be previewing the first night of games, David. Exciting stuff. We'll talk to you next week. You can catch the rest of the the great hosts on Locked on NBA all throughout the week, covering everything from preseason, all the latest news, and more. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you guys again next time on Locked on NBA.